Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that, guys. Just getting a few things set up. See, we have a couple of people watching. We're going to have Dave uh, jump on as soon as it is time. Thank you again for joining us for this uh, special Instagram Live, um, as it were. Or I should say, sorry, I'm so used to saying Instagram Live. YouTube Live. This is actually the first time we're uh, attempting to do YouTube Live. So somewhat new to this uh, framework. And we're just getting a few things set up. And as I say, we're going to have... Uh, Dave joining us very shortly. So just bear with me for a few minutes. Okay. So tonight we are going to be uh, smoking the um, Perdomo Maduro. How's it going, everybody? Just getting this set up. We're uh, smoking the Perdomo uh, 10th Year Maduro. This is uh, the latest release from Perdomo Cigars. And I'm very excited to actually add it to our humidor. And it was uh, Dave Garofalo's um, Cigar Pick of the Year for 2020. Um, and so for those of you who have not seen... Hey, how's it going, Brian? Go ahead and drop your comments down. Good to see you. And if you have any questions in the comments, go ahead and uh, drop that as well. So this is, sorry, here we go. This is the Perdomo 10th year. We now have this in stock. It is included in the uh, sampler pack of our Cigar of the Year sampler pack. Um, it's a very special cigar uh, sample because it was voted on a lot of our customers, what they thought would be Cigar of the Year. So as I say, it's very uh, special to us. That five pack sampler is available on our website right now. So uh, if you want to go ahead and check that out, go ahead and go to our website. You can order it and have it delivered to your door. Uh, we ship across the nation. So make sure that you uh, make that happen. You're not going to want to miss out on these cigars. It's going to include the Dama Velada. Hey, how's it going, Curtis? It's going to include the Dama Velada uh, Toro. It's going to include the Ramoneones, the Liga Zebra, and the Menelik. If you haven't seen my review on this particular um, sample pack, go ahead and check us out also on our channel. Uh, and click that subscribe button so you don't uh, miss any of the uh, content. And so also in that five pack is the Perdomo 10 year Maduro. Very open. The thing that I really enjoy about the cigar is the fact that it is um, it's a Maduro it as a signature flavor um, of a Maduro, some of that sweetness uh, and that strength to it, but it's not overbearingly so strong. So it's a good cigar. It's a good Maduro for people to try and go ahead and test it out. So we're going to go ahead and get this lit up. So for those of you who do not know, um, and we'll hear some of this from, from Dave when he's on, but Dave uh, Garofalo has three shops in New Hampshire, and he uh, started the Cigar Authority podcast, which is also on YouTube and a lot of other podcasting uh, networks. Um, he started this podcast, I believe, 11 years ago. And so uh, with that... He's been able to uh, grow it and continue it. And so I just kind of want to pick his brain tonight. Also, how he arrived at this being his cigar of the year. Should be pretty fun. Right off the bat, ton of flavor and a wide open draw. It's great. So that 10 year, Brian, um, that's going to be uh, around, I believe... It's going to be in the $12 range, depending on the size. So we have it in Robusto. We have it in uh, Gordo, a 6x60, or as they say, a Super Toro. We also have it in the Churchill size. So um, that's going to be in the $12 range. 
Don't know if you guys have tried this yet or if you've gotten a chance to pick up the sampler pack. Um, as I say, it's included in it, and hopefully we'll get a lot of people smoking that cigar and trying it for the first time. Should be pretty cool. So it's been a long road for us, a long journey, but we're officially five days a week, Wednesday through Sunday, um, all thanks to your guys' support and helping us out. I'm just going to pour a little drink here. Good. Josh is uh, smoking it here at the shop as well, kind of watching our show. Thank you for joining the channel. As I say, a uh, historical moment, first time we're actually YouTube Live. I got the impression it was uh, going to be a lot more confusing um, than it was, but so far we're doing okay. Excellent. So, um, yeah, Dave will be joining us in a little bit. As I say, that link, it should be included in the description of this video. Click on that link. Go to our Cigar of the Year pack. As they still last, they're going to go quick, and I suggest that you go ahead and uh, check it out. All right, let's get a few things set up. Let me know. Hey, hey, Dave. So if you want to go ahead and check uh, your email, Dave, as I see you dropped a comment there, go ahead and check your email. You'll see the invite right there, and we'll get you uh, tagged in, and we'll get you online here. Just go ahead and shoot that uh, invite over. Just gonna confirm here. Yeah, I'm really excited, uh, particularly about this um, this cigar pack because it has not only what people deemed their favorites, but also has a lot of my favorites as well. The Ramon Iones is one of AJ's greatest uh, cigars. It's amazing. Um, it's kind of his like a uh, premium blend. You're gonna get a ton of flavor. It's a Nicaraguan puro. Um, and it also includes a Menelik, which is also a, a favorite um, and a great cigar uh, for foundation. So this cigar is, the draw is perfect. I'm getting a lot of like sweetness mixed with a little bit of maybe wood on the back end, a little bit of earth as well. Um, it's just really, really complex. So, all right. Hey, Dave, how's it going? Did it work? Yeah, it, it's working. How are you doing? Should I put these on? Can you hear me okay? Hello, hello. Can you? I can hear you. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you now. All, all right. right. All right. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Sorry all right. for the well, confusion. Thank... Yeah, no, no worry at all. Well, thank you so much for joining us. No, my pleasure. My pleasure. Awesome. So um, I just lit up my cigar, which is the Perdomo Tenure uh, Maduro, and I'm actually smoking. I have one right here. <laughs> awesome. So um, uh, I guess to, to, to start off, um, for me personally, uh, as I kind of alluded to previous, is I've I've been watching your show for some time. Enjoy the, the Cigar Authority. It's very educational. Um, if I want to have a lot of up to date info. You guys are one of the main sources I go to is what's happening in the industry, what new blends are coming out. Um, and so for a lot of my customers here, um, somewhat new to the Cigar Authority or hearing about it. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just filling us in of how kind of your evolution started from where you were and how you kind of got into the industry and then how did that translate into creating a podcast? Um, so b being a cigar retailer, uh, I've advertised for years, traditionally, uh, newspapers, magazines, um, radio, television, and as time was going on, um, they, um, I would, they would actually not accept my money anymore. They, um, the newspapers and stuff, because it was tobacco products, um, not allowing cigarettes, uh, although we're a, a cigar only store uh, decided that they uh, thought it was too close to the same product um it is not it's a, it's a different product right. and they wouldn't allow um the advertising to happen so what do i do um my daughter who was just helping me with the computer right over here to try to get on to this uh <laughs> she said to me 11 years ago uh you got, you need to get into social media and I, I said okay what's that show me what to do she said set up a facebook page for me uh no fancy uh 
time to cut our cigar or anything like that? Time to yeah. light our cigar? <laughs> well, I, I guess, uh, yeah, I've already cut it. I mean, the official cutting would be brought by Perdomo Cigar, so. <laughs> yes, it would. Of course it would. Um, <laughs> It, you know, sometimes I'm sitting at my desk and I'm cutting a cigar and I almost get ready to start saying something as, as, <laughs> as I cut a cigar. It's the craziest thing. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I need to uh, advertise my product and um, th they wouldn't accept the advertising. So let me learn about social media. And in this book I was reading about social media 12 years ago, it mentioned podcast. And uh, you got to imagine 2009 at that point, a brand new uh, thing that was out there. And I said, well, let, let me see what I can do and I'll, I'll uh, see if I can get it working. So I did. And uh, there was nobody listening and nobody knew what podcasting was, but it started up from there. And, uh, you know, I'm not a quitter. I'm, I'm a guy that says, all right, let me keep going here. 11 years into it, um, the, the Cigar Authority continues to do it. And I always believed as, as a retailer, an educated consumer was my best audience. If somebody actually knew what they were talking about, when they came in the store, they realized we knew what we were talking about and we had a good humidification system and a, and a, a friendly staff that was educated and knew about what we talked about. Um, so that's what I always want to do um, at, the, at this point worldwide and to uh, everybody. It doesn't matter where they buy their cigars. Um, I think it's good for the entire industry if we can educate the consumer. Uh, sometimes it goes all the way down to educating maybe the TV station, maybe the, 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 the newspaper people, maybe the politicians to understand that this product is a very different product than the other yeah. products. So that's yeah. it, it, it evolved very different than, than the original thought process of what it was okay. for. Yeah, yeah. Now, during that time, because I know that you had opened a shop and now you've got three shops. Is that correct? Three, three shops. Now, uh, I wonder 11 years ago, there was probably just one again. We had three shops in Massachusetts and um, with uh, taxation that was happening uh, one day in 1995, uh, 10 years into the business. I started in 85. And um, 10 years into the business, they added a 12% uh, tax in the state of Massachusetts. I fought it, and I said to the government that it was unfair if they did it. And if they did, I would close my shops down and move out of state. Uh, they did add the tax at 12%. I moved out of state, closed the shops to the happiness of my competitors because I was moving out. But I said, listen, uh, you wouldn't fight along with me while this was happening. And I know it sounds like 12% and that's not a lot, but they're going to come after more and more. And as they do, the people are going to go buy their cigars. This is before there was really online. Yeah. And now it's even worse, right? So uh, they're going to add tax. Today, Massachusetts is a 40% tax. It was 12 when I left. Um, those stores that said uh, I was making a mistake leaving or happy I was gone, I were all out of business. And it wasn't any good for me. It wasn't any good for them. It's not any good for the state. It's, it's bad education, once again, that I couldn't get the word out to the government to understand that. So that's part of what I do, too, is um, we're one of three states without a, a tax on premium cigars. Florida, where every manufacturer operates out of. Pennsylvania, where all the monster online guys are. And then New Hampshire, where I operate out of, because again, back to education, trying to yeah. get that word out and educate um, not only the media, not only the, um, but it's the politicians. They need to understand. And they're not basically bad people. They're ignorant of what this product is. And when you can educate them and teach them that, they realize, we, know, we don't want to go after that. Kids don't want premium cigars. Uh, we thought it was something totally different. Okay. So you turn them around, and if we can possibly do that across the country and make everybody understand about this product, I'd be a happy person, and everybody would understand. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just as a, a real a, a quick uh, timeout, as I see we have some new guys uh, joining us. Andy, thanks for joining us. Uh, if you have any questions, drop them in the comments. Um, tonight, I kind of want to explore more of just like the industry, top 25 lists, picks of the year, that sort of thing. And also kind of just tobacco business of 2020 and the struggles we've gone through. Um, so if you have any questions, go ahead and drop in the comments. Um, so I guess the question I have for you though, Dave, is um, you said you started in back in about the 80s. 
were you always like a big fan of cigars? Like what kind of pushed you into, okay, I'm going to open up a retail shop in Massachusetts? Well, I, 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 Eric, I looked at you a little bit knowing I was going to be on the show and I, I don't know you at all. And, and thank you for having me on the show. Uh, but it was much like you um, that I was in the entertainment business and I worked nightclubs. I turned um, bar rooms into discotheques in the late 70s. Okay. And it would just be a bar room. And I'd say, let me put a DJ booth in here and a DJ and some lights and, and a mirrored ball. And um, we'll turn this into a discotheque and you can stop making money. And I, that's what I did. And I would have seven nightclubs going on at once. And I built a good little business of it. Well, in those days when um, I would be playing to an audience because I'd work one of the clubs myself every night, I would get myself a cigar before I went into the club. And in those days, you could smoke inside the nightclubs. Uh, just about everybody did, mostly cigarettes. And I was the oddball with a cigar. But I'm the, I was the DJ. And early on in the night, nobody wanted to be the first one in the club. So the DJ's playing to what we call the ashtrays. Just the okay. ashtrays that were on the table. There's no people there. And the bartenders are getting stuff ready. And the bouncers are getting ready. And I stopped playing songs. And nobody's listening. I'd light a cigar up. And I'd just be playing what I liked in the next song. And just warming up before I get into really mixing the, the, and playing to the crowd. And I would look at my cigar. And when the cigar would get finished, I'd put the cigar in the ashtray. And I'd stop my night. And I did that every single night. <laughs> and there I was going to the cigar store, picking up the cigars, and it was a little ritual that I did, but I had nothing to do all day long. I only worked about four or five hours a day, five days a week, and uh, I would be going to bother my friends at their work. I tried golfing. I tried these different things. I said, why don't I open up a little cigar store to give me something to do in the daytime? Well, okay. 10 years into that, um, <laughs> I started getting older, and the audience in the nightclub stayed the same age. So I started creeping myself out, to be honest with you. And I said, <laughs> I got to I gotta do something. And I, and I love this cigar thing. So maybe I can open up a cigar store and see if I can get the cigar store going. And if it starts going enough, I can give up that night job that was honestly paying me a lot of money. And okay. um, I did. It took me about three years of doing both jobs. And then once I was able to actually just get by, uh, and give up the good money. That's what I did. And in that time, I just didn't like cigars now. I became I am a lover of cigars. I became a student of cigars. I couldn't get enough of it. Here I am 36 years into it, and I'm still doing it because I still love it. I followed my passion at that point. And, but what I did was I took, I was a very different retailer, especially in those days, that I took my, um, marketing and promotional side of myself that I did for nightclubs and entertainment. And I brought it into the cigar store and made cigar events that didn't exist, to be honest with you, at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Cigar yeah. dinners, um, uh, bringing manufacturers. I remember asking manufacturers to come to the store and they go, for what? What are you talking about? And I said, no, we're going to make a big deal. The people will come. There'll be questions and answers. And started that whole process of taking what I did in the nightclubs into my new business. And here you are, a, a guy in, in, in that type of field. And I'll tell you, it went over big. And a lot of people have done it now. Now it becomes a regular thing. But to bring your part of your life into your cigar store. I, I watched some of your videos with you dancing and and uh, and all that happening in there. That's what, what it is. I mean, I added music into the cigar store and added entertainment and meet and greets and all this. And uh, it, it became, it evolved into a big thing. And uh, that's, yeah. especially nowadays, that's what the consumer wants. They want to be right. entertained. They want a reason for being. They want ultimate customer service and they want an experience when they come in. And that will be yeah. an experience coming into the human door, watching you do the Charleston around the, around the floor would be an experience for me if I were. Right, 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 right. Well, yeah, no, definitely. And I think I kind of alluded to it when I had emailed you. Um, the, the biggest impression that I get from the Cigar Authority, aside from just the educational part, is there's a lot of moments. I, I mean, I've even gone to archives that you guys have had. Um, and I'll be like, man, how come no one else thought of that? Or how come I didn't think of that? Like, 
I know that coming up, I think at the end of this month, you have like a meatball off or something like that. As yes. well. Yeah. 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 So and, it was just us joking around once that who made the best meatball. And once the show got over, it's like, all right, this, this could be an event. And yeah. we have uh, 50 people to turn out for the event. The tickets sell out in a matter of hours, not days. And um, this year is the first time because of this social distancing thing and stuff. We're going to go virtual with it at the same time. And, you know, it, a bunch of guys making meatballs. I mean, what's that have to do with cigar smoking? Uh, we got a trophy and we, we have uh, a champion and we have fun with it. And, and so does the, um, the, the people that come. It becomes, yeah. if it's fun for me, maybe it's fun for somebody else, right? Right, right, right. Well, and okay, so, um, and, and part of that with like kind of that, creating that experience as such, um, I think is kind of explaining and educating what it is you're smoking, what exactly it is that you're lighting up, the work that went behind lighting up the, the cigar, that sort of thing. Um, so kind of what brings me to the, the question of having a top 25 list. Have you guys always done like your top cigar of the year or did that start a few years ago or like how did that evolve? We started in 1992 and um, uh, it was the first one, the first ever cigar of the year. There was a, um, we came out with a cigar of the year and two months previous to us coming out with a cigar of the year, a magazine came out called Cigar Aficionado and they waited a good 20 years before they came out with a top 25 list. But we okay. would go in and go in year after year, would make a trophy and give somebody the cigar of the year. Because again, back in my music business, there was a song of the year. There was, you know, top lists of songs, the top 40 and all that. And I just brought it in and it evolves into, you know, somebody singing and said, well, that's a good idea. And now there's yeah. how many top lists are out there is unbelievable, yeah. right? <laughs> Yeah. Real quick, we have a question from Toby. He's a regular here. Uh, he's just wondering if you see uh, or one of the next trends in the industry of cigars right now. Is there something that you, you kind of see, whether it's been kind of forecasted or that you it's popped up to you in cigar smoking? Well, um, you know, Trends are tough because you, what do you want is something that looks trendy and ends up having longevity to it. Uh, for instance, yeah. um, big ring gauge cigars, right? That, you know, it looked like it was a trend. It ended up uh, lasting and it still goes well today. Um, years ago, I created a little short, stubby cigar and it was like a nub. And um, later on, the people from Oliva came to me and asked me if it was okay if they would produce a cigar like the one I had done which was very nice of them to ask because most of my um, ideas and stuff are ripped off. But this one was actually asked of me if um, they could come up with Nub, the, the brand Nub. So I said, sure. And uh, I got a, a good little uh, discount, ongoing discount that lasted as long as they owned the, owned the company. And they launched a brand with me, which was good also. But I told them as they were starting the project out that this to me looks like it's a uh, just a, a fad thing that's not going to last. It's just a trendy yeah. type of thing that might be cool, and I don't think it's going to have legs to it. Well, they believed it did have legs. I was wrong. They were right. That brand still exists today. Right, um, right. You know, we've, we've saw over the years, especially during the cigar boom, torpedoes, shaped cigars was, was all the rage. Today, not so much. Um, yeah. They probably sell worse than, you know, than the, the 60 or even 70 ring gauge cigars. Yeah, uh, so yeah. it goes back and forth. The pendulum swings as it's going on. And I've been around a long, long enough to end up watching the pendulum go and say, OK, a Corona's and Lonsdale's and, and uh, Panatella's and Lancero's going to come back. I don't think so. But who knows and watch because right now they are not. And it's, it's right. bigger cigars, it's value. That's how it's right. looked upon. Does that end up coming back? What I do believe is I did watch the trend of full-bodied cigars happen. That I was a mild cigar smoker. When I got into the business, everybody smoked mild cigars. As years went on, we saw manufacturers making stronger and stronger cigars to look off to the point where the, they were making cigars just to blow your head off. There wasn't a lot of depth to it, not a lot of good flavor to a cigar. There's a difference between a full-flavored full cigar and full-bodied blow-your-head-off cigar, but it was going in that way. Mm -hmm. I think it's backed off. I think people are looking for flavor. 
Um, we see some cigars out there now with Connecticut shades, supposedly not your grandfather's Connecticut, a little body, a little more depth to it. So um, I would say that maybe the shade wrapper is going to come back. It looks like mm. it's getting popular again. It probably was always the most popular. But the problem is that's Connecticut shade. Um, yeah. There's only yeah. 40 acres of Connecticut tobacco fields left. 40 acres. It's wow. nothing. Wow. Yeah. And um, now they're using Ecuador. They're starting to grow shade in other countries, including Nicaragua, Honduras, uh, Dominican Republic. They're, they're, they're growing shade also or trying to do so. So uh, they see it too. Um, we saw a, um, a, a surge with uh, Sober Mesa. I don't know if you know the Sober Mesa uh, Brulee. For instance, so uh, Steve put that out. There's a guy that has a following of full-bodied people, and here he is coming out with a shade cigar. Very, yeah. very interesting that he that he did so. So I think Steve sees it too. I think that is a trend going forward. Uh, don't you know if you, you like full of flavored cigars? Don't be afraid to go to the shade and think it's going to be bitter tasting. Uh, it can right. be uh, certain people that make certain cigars, but there's people out there making shade cigars that you look at it and you'll be you'll be shocked when you light the cigar up to the depth and flavor of that yeah. cigar so i think yeah. that'll be the biggest thing we see this year yeah okay and and i i mean i'm right there with you i actually my palate is more full-bodied i tend to move to, toward maduros or like sun grown something definitely more full-bodied um but recently there's a handful of connecticut's that really have like popped for me like uh, the blue and green from gran habano is one of them excellent Connecticut cigar, yeah. of course, from Black Label is is an amazing Connecticut cigar. So yeah, and, and it's kind of that um, that balance of yeah, the strength may be more on the mild to maybe medium, but its flavor and is not one to be missed. Um, and yeah, it's it's definitely more pleasant. So and, oh, sorry, and, go ahead. and all, also the same with like I, I I lived through when when Maduro started up and. Um, people would look at the dark cigar and automatically think, oh, this is very full bodied, it's, it's not for me. And I had a fight with some customers at that, at that time to say, no, no, this one is not full bodied, even though it's dark, don't think it is. Here we're smoking the Perdomo 10th anniversary Maduro, and this is far from his fullest bodied cigar. This is actually yeah. probably a medium plus, but I would say on the ten, even on the 10th anniversary, it's milder than the sun grown and the champagne. Yeah, yeah. W which is very odd. Nobody would think that. Yeah, um, yeah. The Avo Maduro that came out this year is a relatively mild cigar. Um, th there's um, Fuente stuff that's relatively mild Maduro cigars. So it's not everything that's out there. Maduro means sweet. And for, for the reason that people believe that they were full-bodied, the manufacturers purposely made strong cigars because – the guy that liked a sweet, milder cigar wouldn't buy it because it was dark. And the guy that liked a, a um, full-bodied cigar would buy the light-powered uh, Maduro and not be happy with it. So it was a lose-lose yeah. situation. But I think people are starting to get it now. And we're going to, you know, I like milder cigars, but I smoke Maduro cigars too. But not every Maduro cigar. You know, yeah. some Maduro cigars, they're just uh, a La Florida Minicana Maduro. Forget about it. You know, I'm, I'm one and done. If I smoke a cigar like that, I want to smoke lots of cigars during the course of a day. I, I want to. Um, so I have to be careful when I smoke something like that because, you know, I'm shot yeah. at that point. Right. So we have a question from Chip, also regular here. Um, have you, do you feel like there are a few kind of shining lights in younger blenders, like up and coming? Like, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Indiana Ortez. Um, she did like the Psycho Seven. She kind of did. I am. I, well, well I, yeah, I know her dad. I, you know, I, I know her yeah. father. This is the problem as, as I'm getting older now. I, I know their their fathers and grandfathers. So, uh, um, yeah, she uh, is um, the Ortez family. I mean, they're in tobacco. They have it in their blood. So, uh, yeah. you know, uh, and, you know, there's a, a woman, a woman's taste, a woman uh, can taste, smell, and see like 10% more than men on the bottom and top of, of the tasting spectrum. Um, mm -hmm. So they have good, good palates uh, for the most part. And here's somebody that's in tobacco um, her whole life, even though she's very yeah. young to begin with anyway. But I mean, it's in her blood. 
Uh, yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what that does. We're also seeing um, the next generations of families. For instance, Perdomo was smoking. You have Nicholas Perdomo that's in there. I'm dying to see what he does. Alec and Bradley from Alec Bradley. Yeah. You have Leo Gomez's son, uh, his two sons now. Uh, okay. And here they are getting in, and I'm dying to see what they come out come up with. So uh, it, it's it's great, uh, you know, yeah. of a younger everything. Uh, younger yeah. podcasts are coming on. Um, believe me, great. It, it, it's, um, you know, you need a younger perspective. I try to stay young in my head. I try to listen to the new things. But the fact of the matter is I'm getting older. And in order for this to happen, when I got into the business, there was a whole bunch of people my age in here. I was 25 years old when I got into the business. And as time went on, I went from the, and, and it was really odd for a 25 year old smoking cigars, never mind owning a cigar store, of okay. the, the rep coming in and say, hey, where's your father? And I said, well, <laughs> he, he's not here. Why would you be asking for my father? He lives in Florida. Oh, uh, who owns this place? And I own it. And he's, and he's like, what are you, what are you talking about? Because the rep was also a 60 year old, 70 year old guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And now it's a, a younger generation coming in. We need the younger generation for sure. So uh, I'm excited about the, the next group of people coming in blending. Yeah. 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 Well, and I actually, I have to say, cause I, I know you went to TPE this year or sorry, last year as it were. Um, and I, my yeah. wife and I, <laughs> Is my wife and I it was the first trade show that we went to. I, I still haven't made it to PCA. I was gonna try to make it, but of course it got canceled. Um, but we we were at the hotel and getting ready to go to the trade show, and I saw you walking by. I was like, "That's Cigar Authority!" <laughs> like I, I recognized you, um, and I know you gave <laughs> and and you gave. Yeah. I know you gave like a a conference, like kind of like presentation as well. Um, and so it's just it's been. I think in previous industries that I've been like in the entertainment and the stage and stuff, a valuable lesson I learned is more of like, just not, not a dismissing a resource or a point of where you can further your knowledge. Um, unfortunately, I feel like sometimes in the industry that we're in, um, there is a lot of maybe stigma is not the right word, but there's a lot of preconceived notions that some people block themselves off to. Um, some of the best advice I've heard with, if you're new to cigar smoking, try everything and kind of where you start comes in with the education of those podcasts or, I mean, like on all of our price sheets, um, instead of just showing, Hey, here's a sticker price on it. We have the wrapper is this, the binder is this, the filler is this so that people who are new to it, if I'm not available inside the humidor, they can see, I like this cigar. Now what else has a similar wrapper that I can move towards in that same wheelhouse? Well, you know yourself when you got in, you were, you were hurt. You know, maybe you didn't think you were going to get into the cigar business, but you were smoking cigars and you wanted information. So did I. Uh, in, in the early 80s, uh, there was nobody providing any information. There was no magazine. There certainly was no internet. There was no, there was no nothing. And uh, I think the, the, the retailers in those days, they were kind of snooty to you. A young guy walked into a cigar store looking at a cigar. They paid me no attention at all. They were just watching me to make sure I wasn't going to steal something maybe, but yeah. they weren't helpful at all. And they missed yeah. an opportunity. And we, we got very lucky in the early 90s um, that the cigar boom ended up happening. And um, then that's when people really came out, of the, out looking and begging for information. Cigar aficionado was a big part of that. Uh, along with the follow-up of everybody that came out. And now today, information is out there. The problem, though, I got to say, is there's bad information also. There's, there's so much information, and then sometimes I look at it and I go, oh, my God, that's wrong, that's wrong. Hey, yeah, it's, it's, it's out there anyway. Now people have to do their homework and figure out what, what is the truth um, of that. But um, not, not opinion, but truth or not truth. There's opinion also. Listen, is this cigar good? That's an opinion. Is it mm -hmm. good? It's certainly well made. It certainly right. aids tobacco and all this. That's true. But is it good? That's up to the person itself. Right, 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 right. Now, um, so kind of like segueing back, um, as we're smoking the cigar, um, I would, I was curious as, as you've been in this industry quite a while, uh, what kind of stands out to you about the Perdomo Maduro? Like what kind of elevated it to the status that you guys gave it? Um, what we try every year is 
everything, you know, and some people will say, geez, every year you end up picking the cigar of the year and it's a brand that you carry. I find that very interesting because obviously I would carry it if I think it's great. <laughs> Why would I not carry it? So, so right, right. it starts at the very, at the very beginning of October of anything okay. new that comes out and everybody tries to sell us cigars. So everything yeah. comes across the, the table for us to try. Now, the first thing we try to do is we're trying to buy cigars for our, for our retail store. Is this cigar good quality cigar and does it fit somewhere in the mix? So let, let's call this a medium plus cigar. Uh, a Maduro, and here's the sizes of it, and here's the price range that it ranges from eight to ten dollars. Here is what it is. Now let's smoke the cigar. Yeah. Okay, I'm smoking it. Now I'm going to decide: should we give this a try? Right? Should we give this a try in a store? Does this fit? I'm trying to think of all the customers and say, are they going to like it? So okay, it finally gets into the store. Now we're watching people buy the buy the cigars. This is an important factor. The person comes in and buys the cigar. They sit maybe sit in the lounge and smoke the cigar. Maybe they take it with them. I'm watching them the next time they come in. The next time yeah. they come in, do they buy the cigar again? Or do they buy more cigars than they bought before of the same cigar? They're actually telling me without me even asking them. And we have a pretty sophisticated computer system that we can track these things to see these what we call trends, right? Yeah. What is happening at this point? And I'm looking at this data that, that's going there. Uh, at that point, we're all discussing the cigar ourselves to see what we think as the year goes on and deciding, is it a contender for the cigar of the year? And then we put the contenders out. So we make a pack. I saw your pack. You put a pack of contenders um, yeah. of something that's going to be the cigar of the year. And you're letting your customer make the final decision. Mm -hmm. I don't go as far as that. I, I, it's been, I really, it takes me a long time to give complete control up of anything. So yes. I'm not giving complete control, but I do want the input from them. So in there, they have a little email address, secret email address to tell us which one they liked. They must buy that pack. Now, do I want to sell them the pack of cigars? Is that the reason being? It isn't. I want to make sure that they smoked every single one of them because it's unfair when they smoke two of the seven cigars that we had in there and say, this one's a cigar of the year. Well, that's not fair to the other five you never smoked before because you have a yeah. preconceived notion because of the color of the band or whatever it is that you don't like that cigar. I really need to, or your, your vote doesn't count if you have not smoked everything that's in there. At that point, we have the information from the consumer. We have the information from the computers, which is the unbiased vote that the customer doesn't even know they're buying. And then it yeah. becomes the staff of hearing somebody, uh, oh, the cigar didn't draw good on me. Can I have another cigar? There's a problem with it or all that. All those stuff go in there. And then at final, here's all the information. And then it's, okay, based on everything that I can see here, which one is it? The final decision, which mm -hmm. is it? It's this one. And mm -hmm. but all that work does go into it because it really means something to the manufacturer. And, and listen, Nick Perdomo's doing well. He doesn't need my trophy to tell him he makes a great cigar or anything like that. But these are their babies and they really care. Yeah. I said to him, by the way, a trophy's coming to go on your stack pile of other trophies you have, just so you know. And he goes, I love trophies. What they <laughs> love is the recognition for their hard work because every yeah. one of them tried. I don't care what cigar it is, if it didn't make it or anything. This is everybody's baby. And I know the work that goes into making a blend and the years that go into, in, into, into putting it together. And, he, you know, so I try to show a little recognition to every one of them. We have a first place, unlike the top 25, ours is we have a first place and then we have a tie for second. And that's everybody else that was, that was there. So I'm not saying who came in seventh place or sixth. Uh, yeah, everything yeah, yeah. belonged if any, if any of them won, whichever one it was won, it was deserving of what it is. But this year we had a true champion. It was a standout across every element. That's not usually the case. Wow. There's usually yeah. some balance work that ended up happening. But there was yeah. a good contention to it, but we had a clear winner, and I feel good about it. Mm -hmm. Well, and for on our side, um, we, we because we're, we're definitely more uh, on a smaller scale, we're still starting out. Um, so we actually had a, a physical ballot box and we had official ballots. They would sign in, hey, what's your favorite cigar of the year? And then number two, number three, put it inside the ballot box and then we would tally all those up. So I, I along with everyone else, put in a ballot. So for me personally, I couldn't influence 
hey, this is the cigar of the year. We sell the most of it. Let's just push this cigar. And so um, what ended up being our cigar of the year was, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Tim Swanson. Um, he does cigars daily. He uh, He's out in Arizona and he releases yes, his cigar. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he released his cigar brand, uh, American Viking Cigars. And his uh, medium to medium plus, it's kind of like a, it's a, a Habano. It's a... Um, it's, it's sort of sweet and peppery. It's called the Dama Velada. That was voted our cigar of the year for our humidor. And our humidor is pretty small. I kind of showed you a little bit. It's inside of a train car. Um, but it's just exciting because this is what the consumer wanted. This was their vote of what is the best cigar that we have. So, we, and what was funny is because I was like, all right, we'll pull up the, the top four that everyone liked. And then I was like, I don't really have a fifth, but I want to actually bring it together. And then I saw your guys' podcast. And then I was like, well, perfect. We, we're we bringing in the cigar anyways. Let's add it in as something to try all together. Um, so with, with that, do you – what, what was striking to me, and maybe I don't know if you were surprised as well, is that Perdomo seems to be – our top skews are always his Sun Grown. And I know Sun Grown was sort of a, a contender. Um, and so it was a bit of a surprise to me that his Maduro actually outranked his Sun Grown because – it seems to be the more popular, but honestly, it's, I think out of his Maduro lines, the 20th, the bourbon barrel, uh, Habano is definitely one of the, one of the better blends or ones that I enjoy far more for sure. So it is 21 years of doing the cigar of the year for us. We've never had a Maduro win the cigar of the year. This is the first time a Maduro ever won. So, yeah. uh, that's another reason, you know, uh, I was surprised, you know, because, with very few exceptions, maybe Padron, uh, their Maduro outsells the natural with okay. us. Okay. That might be the exception to the rule across the across the board. Maybe a, some of the little Flor Dominicanas might be like that too, but there's very few. Almost every brand that we have, um, the natural outsells or the sun grown outsells the Maduro. Um, and it wasn't in this case. Uh, looking at the numbers, uh, his Maduro, and it, it's striking. The blue on the band, the blue on the box, um, you know, it, you, it, almost like a magnet. You watch people walk over to it, and I'm like, wow, you know, look at this. I'll tell you, blue and green, years ago, during the cigar boom, people used to say, if you put blue or green in the band, it's a failure. And wow. so many brands came out using blue and green. Every one of them failed, and that was always the discussion of what happened. And when he put a blue band on it, I said, ooh, you know, I'm looking at this, he, and, and Nick <laughs> knew, and he says, yeah, that's that's a bunch of bullshit, uh, blue and green or something. He says, it's blue, isn't it a nice looking blue? It's almost cobalt blue yeah, color yeah. type to it. I said, it jumps off the off the page. There's no doubt about it. I hope it doesn't hurt it. It, it didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And oddly enough that you say that in our cigar pack uh, that we have available on our website, this is in there, and also the Menelik from Foundation Cigars by Nick Melillo, which is a green label as well. So who would have known? We um, Yeah, we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the, the bigger events that we do, uh, we do once, sometimes twice a month, uh, we'll do a formal tasting. So we'll have a limited amount of spots. We'll all light up the same cigar, um, and we'll pair it with some kind of really nice, like, whiskey that we put together. And like I say, it sells out pretty quickly because it's so limited. Um, but the Menelik uh, was our first tasting that we did last January. And we brought it in just as a, hey, we're going to experience it together. We'll get all of our impressions, but we're probably not going to carry it normally. It's a very short cigar. Its price is somewhat up there, um, but it had such a um, such a reception that everyone enjoyed. It's now one of our regular sellers inside our humidor. Nice. And so noticing those physical trends is is part of the education, I feel, as a retailer of knowing your audience and knowing your consumers and what they enjoy. Um, not just what you think will basically well, sell. So you, so you told me two brand, two uh, cigar lines that I don't carry. Uh, I love to hear this. There's not enough of this in the cigar industry where uh, two retailers can talk to each other uh, about cigars, and I'm interested in both of them because I don't, I haven't smoked either of them at all. Yeah. And yeah. you know, you you think you can smoke everything? You you can't. You can't. Yeah. And this year was a tough one because. Normally, the reps are around passing a cigar out and, you know, telling us yeah. about it. There was no trade show. There has been barely any reps that are out there at all. And I, I think Nick doesn't even have a, a rep in New England right now. Um, so it gets really tough. I and mean, he is in New England. He's a Connecticut guy. 
Yeah. But um, I haven't seen him at all. And, um, you know, all the travel and thing went away. So certainly some things slipped through the through the cracks this year. And yeah. uh, I'll be looking into, into both of those guys for sure. Yeah. Well, and, and what I'll do is, I mean, if it's just – if your brick-and-mortar address um, is your office, I'll go ahead and send you some of the, like, American Viking cigars. Um, they're, they're, they're an awesome product. They come from uh, a, a Placencia factory. And so they, um, they're just, they're just really good. And it's funny because we brought them in as a small time retailer. We decided to get our distributors license, uh, in February because of American Viking. We're like, we're going to take the gamble. We like their cigars. Um, they ended up being our top four SKUs in our entire humidor across the board. Beautiful. Well, I'm glad you did that too. Uh, the distributors license, there's so many, California is such a, a weird situation because they don't get a lot of stuff. I hear people say, I guess Perdomo is a tough one there in uh, California also, that it's it, it's uh, it's not everywhere, and that's because they're not uh, having a distributor's license. If you're if you're going to stay in the business, if you're if you're really in, you're in. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I don't understand the, the the pushback to it, but there's there's so many people that don't do it and say, uh, I'm just going to buy from wholesalers and it, now it's going to be up to what the wholesaler decides you're going to like. Right. And so you, you remove yourself one away. So uh, good right. for you. Well, and we're, I mean, we're dealing in California, we deal with a 56.93% tobacco tax. So that's mm. on top of retail price. And so it always kills me when, when Barry on the show will say something like, Oh yeah, it's, it retails for this much and you buy it for this box. I'm like, how do you get it so cheap? <laughs> and it's just, it's a different world that we live in. Um, but the weird thing is a lot of retailers out here, they not only, they'll not only double their price, but they'll double the tax price. So you're paying double the tax on top of that, which to me is, is just a different, yeah, yeah. we don't really play that game. And, and more so because it's like, well, you know, I think it's horrible that tobacco tax is that high, but I feel like I give up my voice. If I were to double that tax, why well, I'm making that money then. So I can't complain that tax is that high. And then I think right, it's, a, right. it's not a nice thing to do to yeah. your, your consumers, essentially. Let me ask you, is it a cost of goods or do you pay it after the fact? Do you pay it the second you buy that product? You you have the option of both. Um, so some, some uh, manufacturers, they'll say, we'll give you the option of us claiming the tax or you can pay it later. Um, how I've always kind of based with it is I would prefer to pay things up front if I have the capital to make it happen. It's just an easier way to keep control of things. Um, and sometimes it comes in handy. It's really just there are two types of manufacturers or companies that we deal with. It's either the people that will only deal with distributorship or the people who do both. Um, so, yeah, not having a distributor license really limits your buying power and your portfolio inside your humidor. And so it is. And if a big, I get, if I can, yeah, if no, I, if I give you one, one important, uh, if I was to say to anything to, to a friend getting in the cigar business or anybody, um, the key to success of your business is going to be your selection. Um, it, it just astonishes me so much that I go certain places and everybody has the same exact stuff. So, why would they go to this store as opposed to that store? The same exact. It's closer to me. I like the environment better or, or whatever, uh, short of if your product mix is different than the others. And that's where we differentiate ourselves, um, that I am much like when I was a nightclub disc jockey that I broke music. I was playing music before the music got popular. Um, it's the same thing with cigars that we typically try to break the cigar out. And there's some work involved with it because nobody knows it, but we're there anyway. The staff is there. They're educated on the product, and the customer wants to see new things any anyway. We do not bat a 1,000 by any means. We pick some stuff, and it didn't work out. We thought it was going to be good. Maybe the manufacturer doesn't have the working capital to keep his brand going and ends up selling it off to the online discounter and terrible stuff that happens there. Um, I, I live and learn as, as we go on. But um, a lot of the things that is a success of us is people coming in and saying, wow, I've never seen so saw that brand before yeah. because yeah. it's not in everybody that's around us. 
but it requires extra work to actually educate the person. Uh, right. And I'm okay with that, but it does differentiate. Your product mix is your key thing that right. to differentiate you from everybody else. Right. Well, and I mean, this is going to probably come as a bit of a shocker, and I'm not even saying it's a good business tactic. It's more of just like knowing your customer and what we want to try and stuff like that. We um, have... I don't know if Perdomo, I don't know if you would consider personally Perdomo a heritage brand. Would you say that is or not so much? It's uh, 25 years this, this year. It's 25 years. Um, I, I've, I'm an early customer of theirs from the garage days when they were operating out of the garage. I think everybody knows what the brand is, especially in, in the Northeast. I mean, it's a monster up there. He's yeah. one of, I'd, I'd say he's in the in the top five of all brands that are out there at this point. Okay. So absolutely. The, re the reason I ask that is that Perdomo would probably be the closest thing to a heritage brand that we have in our humidor. Most, most of our uh, cigar, I, I, I guess Aganorsa is kind of in there. I mean, they've kind of moved away from Casa Fernandez. Uh, the name, but I mean, Agonors has always been around, but we have more uh, names like um, Casa Cuevas, Foundation, American Viking. We do have Roma Craft, um, but most of them are boutique lines, um, and it tends to be more of the experience our customer base wants, um, and it's also more of just coming together of like, like I said, bringing in those cigars and noticing what people enjoy. Um, I mean, I guess AJ is kind of up there too. He's kind of a bigger name, but Southern Draw is also a big cigar that we we move as well. So we we eventually want to bring in more heritage, but with our selection, we're we're mostly a boutique uh, company. In there, that's good. You you'd see the same in our store that um, the bulk of the stuff, um, you know, these things become big names after a while, but they yeah. they they all started off with. You know, the fluid Dominicana, my account number is three. That's my account number. <laughs> yeah. And, and they were they were little, they were a husband and wife team, and yeah, yeah, I'll take the brand on and we'll see what it does. And here it is all these years later, and you look at it as 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 a big brand. They're still family owned and operated companies, you know. Yeah. I, I don't like the corporate stuff myself. I want to deal, I, I end up getting to know the owner of the company. And it, it yeah. says Perdomo on here, but it's it's Nick. You know, and, yeah, yeah. and uh, that that's how it becomes. And uh, his success should not push you away that, okay, now it's not boutique and it's not cool anymore because he's successful. Right. It's, right. You shouldn't be, uh, you know, uh, hurt because of, of your success. Um, when you sell the company off to somebody else who a big conglomerate and the cigar changes at that point, then, then all deals are off at that point, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's an interesting thing. And actually, Perdomo, we, the only the only box we brought in when we first started was just his tenth year champagne. It's his biggest mover. It's one of his most popular. People, I, I believe, they see that yellow cellophane and they pick it up off the shelf. Hey, this is different, uh, and it's just a phenomenal cigar altogether. Yeah. Um, the only reason I brought it in was because my younger brother was like, he's he's completely all about Perdomo, and. Through his influence, he bought a five pack. He's like, I will give you a free cigar if you promise to at least bring in one more box for Perdomo. And I was like, all right, I'll make the deal with you. I'll take a free cigar. <laughs> and now when you, have I mean, people, when you have people giving you things to please do it, L listen to the yeah. customer. Listen, you know, you have to do right, that. Right. And now Perdomo is one of our bigger, bigger skews. It's one of the bigger movers. Um, we do have a question from Joshua, uh, mm -hmm. though. He's asking, as you have you ever created your own cigar cigar brand and i know you have a few that cigars that you have like just for you um i think the most humorous is the any cubans story which i've heard you talk about before and how, how did that <laughs> sure so i made lots of cigar brands um because back in the day i used to try to compete at that time i try to compete with JR Cigars, which was Lou Rothman. He had a big catalog out here. I was a retailer and I wanted to be able to have cigars, be able to different brands, but be able to have something at that price level. And I could never buy things that price level. And the only way to end up pulling that off was to actually make cigars. And over the years, I, you know, because of FDA now, we, we had to figure out, you know, how many different things I've made over the years before the predicate date. So the answer was 350 different SKUs that I created before the predicate date that ended up happening. So there were lots of them. Some of them stuck around that still exist. Um, Dos Ombre, which meant two guys, which is what we put out. 
was our first. Then we did La Gianna when my daughter Gianna was born and I made a brand for her. And then I started getting cute as time went on with different brands. And I would go to great manufacturers and friends uh, to end up making these cigars. But the customers always came in and said, hey, you got any Cubans? And I'd say, <laughs> no, they're illegal. And I'd tell them the same story. And uh, then it dawned on me one day. And this, I went to the people, uh, of the Aroa family who owned Camacho at the time. And I said, I want to make a brand called Any Cubans. And that's the <laughs> brand. And they said, oh, my God, so what's up with that? We don't have Cuban tobacco. I said, it's for when the person comes in and says, do you have any Cubans? I walk them right over to any Cubans. That'll be funny, right? And there it'll be. So they're like, oh, God. Uh, and, and money talks. I said, okay, I'll buy 200 boxes of three sizes each. So uh, do you want 600 box order? Because I think it's going to end up working out. And they're like, yeah, we're going to take your money. Okay. So we make the cigar and they made, it was a good cigar. And uh, yeah. we put the cigar out and it worked completely the opposite. Nobody thought it was funny except me. And I had to pay the price for it because we had to close it out and get rid of it. <laughs> now, now, kind of in that skew of creating your own cigars, the firecracker kind of falls into that that realm, right? Like the, the, like the project, because you have a new firecracker every it year, did. right? That was at the same time that I made the nub, that I had nub and I had firecracker. And um, uh, Jose Oliva loved the, the nub looking cigar and ended up putting out nub uh, with my blessing and ended up going forward with it. And congratulations to him. As I watched that happen as an entrepreneur watching somebody take something that I came up with and hit a home run with the thing, grand slam, that this thing yeah. was everywhere. I said, here it was right in my hand and I didn't know what to do with it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna do something now with that firecracker. I'm gonna work that firecracker because this was the other one. We'll see what we can end up doing with it. So over the years, I had a few different manufacturers make it. And then um, I had somebody make up a, um, a one-time release with it and that's what really brought it to the ball game at that point so we have an annual release that we go to a different manufacturer every single year with it uh which will announce um the 2021 actually tomorrow on the cigar authority uh what that's going to okay. be you'll, you'll be pleasantly surprised to hear that answer okay yeah. that's a tease what we do in the <laughs> podcast business but you will be pleasantly surprised who it is because you you've brought them up already today and um that really caught on and the name of the company that distributes this is is my company also which is united cigars and the idea of united cigars was to unite this industry and yeah. a lot of times and i don't know if you're there yet where you're going to do multi-vendor events at your store having more than one vendor at the same time the manufacturers don't like to do that they want all of it right and what i want to do is i think there's strength in numbers i think if me and you a friendly and share information will both grow and the right. same goes for manufacturers if they will share information and help each other rising tides raise all ships and everybody will be right. better for it there's been too much of this secretness information or misinformation that goes out to them we're a teeny boutique industry the whole mm -hmm. industry you talk about a boutique cigar we are yeah. a boutique entire industry premium cigars one out of a thousand people use the product the average person smokes two cigars a year it's about 300 million cigars a year in the united states there's 360 million people it's less than one cigar per person per year this industry is so teeny can we just yeah. be together and if we are we can fight legislation we can we can teach the customer we can build it that's what the cigar boom did in the 90s everybody was together and then greed took it took place and different things happened. And I watched it deteriorate back into this person's not even talking to that person. So United yeah, yeah. Cigar idea was to put the retailer together, let retailers start working together, let manufacturers working together. And we have plans for even more different items to come together with different manufacturers. I like seeing it that AJ Fernandez, you brought his name up, that we have Valtadas working with AJ Fernandez. And yeah, yeah, yeah. we saw Pete Johnson working with, with somebody for a, for a Henry Clay or whatever uh, yeah. item that he did. And these collaborations and things, we have Fuente and Padron 
making a cigar for each other. Uh, these are good things. These are really good things that everybody works together. And, and that's the, the whole idea of Firecracker now, along with the entire United portfolio. That's, that's yeah. what it's for. Well, even that in, in that kind of like that spirit of collaboration, as I've heard uh, too, um, I heard that Padron is doing a collaboration with Fuente um, as well, which, I mean, I don't know too much info yes. on it. But I mean, when I hear that, I'm like, wait, wait, what cigar is this? I want to go ahead and try it. Um, and one of the biggest like kind of synergy moments with us is uh, actually working with American Viking Cigars with Tim Swanson at Cigars Daily. Um, he, being in the industry for, I think he's been in the industry for about eight years or so, um, he's kind of taken us by the hand in some of our novice ideas of getting online, getting our website up and going. Um, and it's just in that kind of spirit, it is true. The more that you, you kind of come together, it helps both parties. It's not a absolutely. It's yeah. It's not another situation like that. Yeah. And and listen, I don't think you are just on the receiving end of this, talking to people that have been in the cigar industry for a long period of time. Here's what happens to us: that we can't see past the trees now at this point because we're so deep in the cigar industry. What's new? We have no idea because I'm talking about things in the past. I'm living now, and here's a young person coming in into the industry. Very, very important because I have no idea what this this generation is looking for. What's hit to you? What's cool to you? Uh, we need to hear that, and that's why it ends up working both ways. You know, uh, yeah. Yeah. we'll give the old information and what we end up having, but more importantly, what is the future? You have the future, not me. So, what what is that? And uh, together, you'll be better and I'll be better too. Right, 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 right. Now, do you think uh, being kind of seeing the trends and, I mean, going through this last year of 2020, um, just on your opinion alone from how you see it, do you think trade shows like TPE and uh, PCA, do you think that is a option this year or do you think it's going to be pushed back another year? Well, today's news came out that the TAA, which is the Tobacconist Association of America, there's only about maybe 60 or 80 people that's part of that, quote, the the um, best retailers or whatever you want to end up calling it. And it's unfair to end up saying it, but that's how they end up saying it. It's, it's people that have been around them for a long time. That was canceled today, and that was scheduled for uh, May. But so is TPE, right? Right. Right, so right. I think this is the first shot, and I think um, I think they have to give them ninety days notice. So maybe by February or something, they'll make a final decision whether to cancel that out. Uh, what a, what a shame, because, especially for you that you know looking forward to it so much that it'd be your right. first ones going to and all that. Um, because uh, you know, it, it's another world when you go there that, you know, your eyes are going to be opened up. You're going to, eyes will be bugged out like this. I mean, you'll be right. taking so much, so much in that's going to happen. And, and that's where you make relationships and you meet people, other retailers uh, mm -hmm. at breakfast or dinner and sit next to you and stuff. And, uh, you know, I remember going years ago and Jeff from Corona uh, sitting with him. He was his first year in and I was, uh, you know, maybe five or six, seven years in at the time and we got friendly with each other and I watched this guy go, you know, right to the top and, uh, you know, friendly with him all the way through. Whoever it is that you're going to bump into and be friendly with and a guy that just started out or a veteran that's been around for a long period of time and uh, everybody, everybody goes, including manufacturers, the little guy that you look at today. Uh, you take his brand on and he and he's in a little teeny booth and he's just starting out. Uh, and the next thing you know, there he goes and he's the next one. Uh, yeah. And I love it. I love watching that. Um, the, the guy, uh, uh, Lorenzo, that does um, hotcakes, HVC yeah. cigars. I don't know if you carry any of his. He's a new guy that, you know, a, a few years in. And uh, I think he's going to be one of the big ones. I think uh, I'd, I'd bet on him that he'll, he'll be one of the big players too. And that's fun watching, you know, the rookie of the year and, and yeah, who's yeah, going to yeah. uh, make it to the top. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and it's interesting because one of uh, – we when we first arrived at TPE, <clears throat> it was like the night prior to the first floor show, um, and we're just kind of hanging out at the hotel. And then it, you start noticing people that I've seen on social media. I'm like, oh, there's – there's uh, 
Omar from Fratello, and there's uh, Boveda Rob, Rob uh, Gagne from Boveda. And, and so like just making those, um, those contacts. And so we, we actually befriended, uh, just as you kind of like alluded to, a owner, it was a husband and wife who owned a shop in uh, Iowa. And just kind of what they, uh, sorry, Ohio, and what what they've done, and kind of just him educating. Hey, this is my fourth show. This is what you're going to want to look for. These are the people you want to talk to, and um, it's just really educating. We have uh, Chip just dropped a uh, comment about HVC as you're sp speaking about hotcakes. He uh, he's a regular here, and he keeps subtly hinting or not so subtly hinting he keeps giving me hvc cigars saying hey when are they going to come in when are they gonna come in? And, and they're they're really really good i mean they're they're awesome um i think one of our first leaps was bringing in agonorsa and all of their stuff and i know they supply tobacco for hvc um and there's yes. just phenomenal stuff coming out of there as well yeah we can't carry it all there's no doubt about it you have to <laughs> figure out what's what and what's going to work for you. And you're going to win some and you're going to lose some on your own or you're going to miss yeah. some. But if you miss it, that doesn't mean you can't go back to it. I've missed a cigar. It, it came out a couple of years ago. I tasted it. I tried it. I th thought no. And then I hear more chatter out there. It's great that the there's the internet now and people in, in other podcasts. and other, I listen to everybody and mm -hmm. uh, I hear it and I take note of what this is and let me try it again. I try it again, and I say, maybe I missed this. Maybe, all right, let's give this a, a shot and, and bring a, some in and, and uh, see what ends up happening. The problem that happened with me is I have three retail stores, and they're, they're busy, busy stores, so my little purchase is pretty big to begin with. So uh, when I roll the dice, it's, it's more expensive nowadays yeah, to roll yeah, the yeah. dice to give, a, to give it a fair shot because yeah. taking one size of a product, uh, I've done it before, and – uh, it's unfair to product, to be honest. Uh, it, it really needs to hit a home run for one size of one product to be seen and have a chance. It needs a footprint of at least three, maybe four sizes of something to be able to be seen well enough to give it a fair shot. So I'll buy longer than I'll buy deeper. In other words, I'll buy four sizes of something yeah, as opposed yeah, yeah. to say, give me two sizes and give me four of each. It's a better shot. And, and give it its fair shot and see if it can end up uh, happening. That's a, another uh, very positive thing that I've learned over the years of okay. um, because you want it to succeed, right? You want to give yeah. it every fair shot to succeed as it does. When I've done it the other way, very few and far have ever made it because I didn't go wide enough. Okay, okay. Now, it, like one of the, the, the milestones that we just hit is uh, this week is the first week we're – we're going full time. So in other words, I've been working a side job and then doing our tobacco business on the weekends. Um, and so we're finally making that leap of going full time, just the tobacco shop, um, kind of where you were at um, as well. Yeah. And so was there a similar type of like leap when you went from one shop to three shops or were the numbers there to kind of like just open that up and make it happen? The day changed the day I made the leap. So congratulations to you because it is a uh, very risky move to end up making. I was making a lot more money at my other job at that time. Yeah, um, yeah. And I was losing money, to be frank, with, with the cigar store at the beginning. So it took about three years until I looked and I said, okay, if, if I eat uh, ramen noodles and this and this and this and I, <laughs> I struggle by, it's enough that I could, I could survive. But yeah, yeah. what's going to happen when I give 100% of my attention to the cigar business as opposed to the music business and everybody I employed on that side? And I didn't sell the business. I walked away from it to go into the cigar business. So I said, okay, I'm going to end up doing this. One year after I went full time, I was able to open the second store. My business didn't double, it tripled because I put 100% attention on it. Yeah. Um, and, th and then it was another two years or so I got the third store. I never went more than three stores because I never thought I could handle, you know, I, again, you know, I, I have to be all in on all this. I can't sit yeah. back and let somebody else be doing everything. Um, so, so I'm in on it and, um, giving a hundred percent of my attention to it changed it the day it ended up happening. We, uh, you could just see the difference of what it is. It was, it was mental and it was also physical of doing it because yeah. staying up till two o'clock in the morning and then opening the store in the morning, I, I, I couldn't give it a hundred percent because I was worn out 
and yeah. broken down at that point. And now I was refreshed and energetic. And uh, that was the success of it, given it all. You, you see that um, there's some shops that have absentee ownership. There's some manufacturers that put other people in charge. It never really works out. It's very, very hard. Nobody's going to care like you are about your place. You can have a great employee and they're going to they're going to care a lot, but they're not going to care like you're going to care or your wife is going to care um, when you, you know, if she comes in and jumps in with you too. And yeah. really, uh, it, it changes everything up at that point. But you got to make sure that you're going to be able to live, you know. Right, right. So it that's exactly what I did, but you, I think you've only done a little over a year at this point and jumped in, right? Yeah, yeah. We're about a year and a half in uh, from starting up. When we yeah. started, we were uh, Friday through Sunday, and then we added Thursday, so we're four days a week, and now that we're five days a week. Um, and a lot of that, I mean, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, it's like you are you get up at four in the morning, you start getting all your, your advertising and your social media together. I mean, yesterday... Uh, we released like a YouTube video and uh, updating product on the website. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's constant. It's constant, but, and it's too hard to do when you're being pulled in another direction and being pulled in another like job. And so um, it, it, when to, to me, I guess like we kind of played a bit more safe and close to the chest of like, okay, the numbers are there. We just need to make that leap. It's not as uncertain maybe as possible. Um, but honestly, a, a lot of that pushing is from is from podcasts and guys like you, like, okay, seeing this, this is how it happens and this is how you make it happen. And really um, that relationship of retailer and consumer and making that basically come together is really what we're, our focus is. Um, I mean, I remember same thing starting, started getting into cigar smoking uh, when I was about 20 to 22. And I, th I think it was on your podcast of, of coining the phrase of walking the gauntlet of you walk into a, a shop and everyone turns to you and like, okay, who are you? You're a newcomer. And are you mm. here to steal something? So I'd grab my Liga Pravada nine hat, put it on and start trying to drop names and being like, okay, he, he knows cigars. And so, <laughs> and, and kind of trying to make that happen. And it's more, we don't want to be that shop. We want to be that shop where we're welcoming and what do you like to smoke and what do you like to try? Um, we had a customer come in, and he's been buying from us for a while. And he finally asked, he's like, what's your favorite cigar in the humidor? So I recommended a cigar. And he's like, why didn't you tell me about the cigar when I first walked in? And I was like, well, what you explained of what you wanted in a cigar, that's not completely it. And I'll give you what you want. And if you want to try what I love, then go ahead and try it. But it's more of that that one-on-one -on -one relationship of this is what you want and this is what you want to try, essentially. And, and I think um, yeah. it's actually Tib Swanson who I heard the phrase of, if you're new to cigar smoking, then your best cigars to smoke is just ahead of you. And kind of that experience of right. everything you're going to try is the first time, and it's going to be that amazing. Yeah, and it's, and it's going to be for you too uh, yeah. as you go through it. You know, when you, Especially when you go to the trade show, it's going to be nuts. That, uh, and I hope it happens for you that it, it's going to be a crazy experience of you don't know what to do and be careful of your, your pocketbook at that point because yeah. these are professionals on the other end. Uh, right, right, right. Uh, they're out to try to sell you the cigar, but um, you go on the budget and you try to maintain your budget and not go too overboard. And um, for you to make the leap after a year and a half, uh, I think you love it. That's why you're doing it. And... Um, what I'd like to ask you is, you, you told me you have uh, um, a train car that's there, and um, how did that turn out? And, and is there another train car that's a cigar store? Not that I know of. Um, I, I think it's unique, and I don't see any pictures of the outside. I'd love to see a picture of what it looks on your website or something to show yeah, it's okay. a train car. Okay. Yeah, so um, kind of. So basically the owners of the building, what we lease, this train car was placed in the uh, later 50s. It's a 1913 train car, um, and it was built as an extension of a storage space for the existing building. The building itself was built in the 40s. It was a fruit stand, basically. We live in apple country. Apple grow, apples uh, grow great up here. Um, I've been up in here in the, in the mountains for about 13 years now. And so um, friends, but also somewhat like removed relatives, had just been kicking around an idea saying, hey, we'd love to, we do our own micro cidery up here. We have a bakery. We'd love to do a cigar situation. So how it kind of came about is 
I, I was like, hey, I'm interested, but if it's my shop, I don't. I, I'm kind of through working for other people. In other words, like putting in that 110 percent just for the paycheck. I'd rather take the gamble and create create our own business essentially. And so, I mean, we it, it was a situation with my wife. I'm like, I don't know if she's gonna go for this type thing. And so I told her, and she was like, Oh, you, you got to do it. Like it totally makes sense. We got to make it happen. So. Um, we reached an agreement. It worked out. And so we we have a small private sectional of the train car itself, which is where I'm sitting in, which is kind of our like smoking private room. The other side is our, our humidor and it's a refrigerated car. So that protects it against elements and extreme weather because we're I mean, we get snow, nice. we get heat, we get all of it. Um, and then on the back patio is where we kind of have our like smoking tent. Um, and it just, it, it kind of worked out and it, my, my love for like vintage films of the thirties and the forties kind of just, just meshed together in that, uh, that idea of we're in an old train car, hence the Charleston dancing. I, I used to choreograph, uh, like Charleston and swing dancing and teach it to people as well. So it just kind of, kind of clicked together. Um, and our, actually our door to our humidor is really cool. It was in a storage unit from one of the owners and it's a door from 19, like 10, 1911. And it still has where you can, the small window where you can pass mail through. And so that, mm. that flap stays closed. It's a huge like window um, into the door and it's just kind of brought it all together. So. All right. So you got an experience walking in there and uh, Mr. Jonathan, who does the podcast would be, would love you because he is a living legend of dance. Um, he's okay. a champion swing dancer and teacher. Uh, really? And we make fun of him all the time, but he is a top, <laughs> top. Um, he goes to conventions. He's a big deal, or he tells me he's okay. a big deal anyway. <laughs> and uh, if I if I could ever get you two together, uh, maybe at a trade show or something like that, but uh, have a dance off. You mentioned um, Omar De Frias. For Tyler. Yeah. He came up and he considers himself a great dancer himself. Okay. And, uh, we actually had a dance off competition in the store. Uh, and the place was packed. Everybody came to see this, and they had to do three dances a piece. And um, Omar ended up beating them. And Jonathan says it was a bunch of bullshit and stuff, but uh, uh, it was a great time. And and going on to your your site, looking at your different things, uh, I, I believe it might have been your first video you put out. You said you you planned on opening the store, and you said we want to do things like um, dance night, poetry readings chess tournaments and i said well there's a whole bunch of stuff i've never tried before and very very different so you're looking outside the box you're looking at what you like and see if if you like it maybe somebody else is going to like it and that was the whole me getting into cigar business my friends thought i was out of my mind in 1985 smoking a cigar never mind opening a cigar store because it was an old man's business and i said if i like it there's got to be other younger guys that are going to like this too. And at the beginning, it was a bunch of old guys that were coming in. And then slowly, it started evolving into a younger population of it. And I would say, um, you know, somebody in their 30s and 40s now is my average customer, not the old guys like me. I'm an old guy in, in this shop. I'm 60 years old now. That would have been the norm when I got into the business 36 years ago. But it has definitely gone to people appreciating Fine cigars, scotches, like young kids weren't drinking scotch. Now you're getting 30-year-olds that can have a palate for, the palate is the most important thing. Is there a palate for that generation? Uh, there is for you. I tell you, the people that work for me are all younger, and uh, they're loving cigars too. So a metamorphosis has happened, has changed, yeah. that a younger yeah. person can appreciate this. Yeah. So yeah, look yeah. at them. Look. Well, and I think honestly, if I were to contribute, like uh, attribute it to anything, it's the education element. That that education, starting with podcasts like your own, and that that finding for me when I got into it, it was like, oh, the wrapper can affect the taste of the leaf. So, what kind of wrappers are there? What kind of tobacco seeds? And that happened through a cigar aficionado. That happened through cigar authority. That happened through your guys's education and kind of laying that groundwork to kind of run with it as well. Um, so, um, yeah. I want to thank you for joining us. However, I would like to ask, um, out of, 
A few questions I would have is what would be one of the first premium cigars that you enjoyed on another level? In other words, that you tried it and you said, okay, this is something special. There's got to be more out there like this. Like what kind of left, left that first lingering impression uh, different than other cigars? Wow. Way, way back then when it, when it first started, I mean, one of the first ones that stood out that seemed like a very, very different cigar than anything was probably in the um, late 80s, I smoked a cigar called La Gloria Cubana. And La Gloria Cubana was a, a guy that made him in Miami, Ernesto Carrillo. Yeah. And my parents lived in Florida at the time in Fort Lauderdale. So I said, I'm going to go see them. And then I'm going to go see this guy uh, that's making this La Gloria Cubana cigar. And um, I went down to see him. I, I met him. Um, and he taught me about why his cigar was different, the different types of tobacco he was using. Remember, this is before the magazines or anything that was out there. And I said, okay, I'd like to give it a try and, and bring these cigars in. And again, there wasn't many people around to tell you of a cigar that your wholesaler didn't carry at that time. There wasn't many that I was open up direct with uh, early on. And then we, I took that on. It was a different world because it was Macanudo, at that time, yeah. I mean, it was, you know, just um, uh, not that there was anything wrong with those products, but I remember Macanudo in those days was Jamaican tobacco. So that was a completely different cigar also than it is today. So we yeah. had Jamaican cigars, Royal Jamaican, Macanudo, and then we had um, things that were made in the Dominican Republic. Nicaragua didn't exist because Nicaragua was an embargo against Nicaragua at the time. So there was none of that. So here was a guy using different tobaccos in a blend that tasted very different. We did very good with it. And then it was always looking for the next thing. When Fuente came out with shaped cigars of Hemingways and short stories and different things like that, that was a different thing that went on. Uh, Opus X comes out using uh, Dominican grown outside wrapper. Never existed. There's a different thing. And then maybe about 10 years ago came um, a company that was um, selected tobacco that made Atabe. And it was Costa Rican cigar. Um, actually, no Costa Rican tobacco in it, but made in Costa Rica. Very, very unique to me. His whole uh, portfolio that was there. And actually, the distributor at that time was in California. So oh, wow. I said, uh, geez, I, I want to try this cigar. And they said to me, oh, you know, this is just 10 years ago. They knew who I was, which was, you know, previous to that, people didn't know I'm just a retailer or something. But they said, wow, you, you're going to give this a try. I said, yeah, I'm going to give it a try. We did so well with it um, that um, they moved the distribution to us because we were doing wow. so well with, with the cigar. Yeah. And it, it became my favorite cigar. And then I moved on from there and uh, – you know, said, okay, let, let's get this thing going and start distributing for other people at the same time. Um, you know, maybe we can help them in a way because yeah. um, the distributor that, that was in California wasn't interested in doing it anymore, uh, wasn't getting any legs with it. It required, um, I really think it required a retailer that understood the product and that's not what he was. And it, it needed, the story needed to be told and the cigar needed to, you know, because it was giving no information. This was a undisclosed cigar. You know, you can't tell any information about it. I don't have any information about it. Here's what the story is. So these, these anomalies that came out over the years uh, always piqued my interest of um, okay. when the chisel came out from La Florida Dominicana. Wow, that, that's interesting. Yeah. That's something different. I, mean, I got to try it. Well, if I got to try it, maybe everybody has to try it, right? Hey, let yep. me bring that in. This is a, a beautiful, and my humidor doesn't look the same as it did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It, it's all different. It evolved. Very, very few things remained that stayed constant. You know, there's very, very few that end up uh, living the life of, of those times. And even the ones that did, it's because of the heritage name of it, because the cigar isn't even the same as it was before. So yeah. people yeah. still believe in it because of its name. But uh, typically in our store, and I would recommend to do this to your employees. If you, I don't know if you even have employees, but if you're going to get employees or do it for yourself, have your wife do it for you, is we smoke cigars with our bands on it all the time. Because 
we get caught up ourselves in the, the company and the brand and the information I know about the company may not be the information that the consumer knows about the company. Therefore, you okay. give it a break because you know the guy, you know the company, mm -hmm. it's a good cigar. So I'm constantly smoking unbanded every day, to be honest with you. It happens every day that whoever gets in the store first unbands a couple of cigars. The other guy comes in, here you go, and you sharpen your palate, you get skilled, and you don't get caught up in um, – you know, I, I know them all. I love them all that are in the cigar business, but I want what's best for the company and the consumer that comes in. Uh, yeah. and, and why blenders are so important is the tobacco changes every single year. This is not a widget. This is a grown product like wine that, you know, the wine companies are decent enough to actually put the data on the wine. The cigar companies are not. Well, next year's crop is different and a good blender can make it so exact you can't tell the difference and that is a great blender when they can do that but over time the brand changes because it's insignificant this year next year is another insignificant one but added up it changes the cigar ends up changing yeah yeah okay now and then the, the other question i would have is if you currently uh, whether you want to call it just 2020 or just in the recent months if you could name like three cigars that you really enjoy normally or like hey these really stand out to me they're some of my favorites are there could you could you name at least three cigars that you really enjoy on the normal basis that that are something special to you yeah uh so aladino we didn't bring up aladino that's the uh aroa family the original people that did camacho back in the day and taking yeah. nothing away away from davidoff who bought the company the cigar is not the same as it was. You can say it's better. You can say it's worse. It's certainly different tobacco because they don't buy the tobacco from where they bought the tobacco from. So it's a different right. product. Aladino, on the other hand, is authentic Corojo. He was the guy in El Corojo, Cuba, with the seeds. He never sells his tobacco or anything. That cigar is outstanding. Okay. That Corojo tobacco. Their regular line is the El Corojo blend. But when you go into their Connecticut shade, for instance, it's all Corojo except the outside wrapper. When you go into their Maduro, it's all Corojo with the exception of the Maduro wrapper. Or you go to their vintage, and that's all Corojo with the exception of the outside wrapper, a third different wrapper. All exceptionals, but the regular Corojo is outstanding. You want to taste what real Corojo tastes like. Just a regular Aladino, not priced very high, um, but an exceptional cigar and one that I crave. That every once in a while, I'll leave go leave the office, go downstairs. My office is upstairs. I come downstairs. I got a lot of cigars in my office, but I have that craving for that cigar. Well, so, and it, it's uh, funny, it, and it's funny you bring that up because uh, I honestly, until hearing your podcast, I, I had like little exposure to Aladino, and um, there is a small shop about uh, about an hour from us um, in Palm Springs area that carried it, and I was like, hey, I've heard this on the the cigar uh, authority. I know that Jonathan really likes to smoke the cigar. I'll give it a try. Um, and it was something special. And I've actually had a few people come in and say, Hey, what about Aladino? So it's definitely on the radar, but I, again, it was exposed through your podcast. Um, and it's, yeah, definitely a special cigar. And, and they're growing. I mean, they had to start the company from scratch after they sold the company. They had so many years that they couldn't be in the business. And then they came and started it up again. And it's, you know, it's not on the top of everybody's radar, but again, it is very exceptional. And you watch what happens years from now, it's going to be on the tips of everybody's tongue, I would guess. I mean, that, 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 yeah, that's yeah. my guess and my gamble that I'm making in the store. Uh, another oddball one is an old, old brand, 200 year old brand, and it's Toscano. Have you ever smoked a Toscano before? I, I No, I actually haven't. Okay, Toscano is, you talked about um, the Kentucky Fire Cured tobacco that yeah. um, Drew Estate does and things. Well, it all started with this company from Italy called Toscano, and they made the old uh, stogie-looking, rough-looking cigars. Uh, you can cut them in half if you want. I don't recommend to do it with any cigar. The only one you can do it because it's actually baked. I mean, you cut it in half, and it's not going to fall apart or anything. Um, some people smoke just a half of it and then go to the other half later or you smoke it um this is um real good tobacco that is in the barn and and while it's in the drying process 
they actually um, burn uh, wood that's in there and it actually creates this um, barbecue type of flavor to the tobacco because of the smoke that, that's created inside there. Uh, it's not that it's a very expensive cigar or anything, but every once in a while, it's something that nothing else will do. It has to be that. Okay. And it's almost to an embarrassing point because I shouldn't be seen walking around with an inexpensive cigar in the cigar store and stuff, but it, it's that. I just feel like, you know, I say to people, just sometimes you want a hot dog, right? You don't want filet mignon. You want to eat a hot dog or something. Uh, it's one of those cigars, too. It, it's so off the radar, but um, it, it's another one of those uh, go-to cigars for me. And the third one is that um, Atabay, which is my favorite, favorite cigar. Uh, they're, they're way too expensive. And uh, e even, you know, that I'm buying at wholesale and, sm and smoking my own stash uh, at, at a fraction of the price of what um, it retails for, it's still an expensive cigar. And I try to treat it that way too, that I'm not gonna chain smoke those cigars and smoke them all the time because I'll take away the specialty to them. But, uh, you know, every once in a while, the last cigar of the year that, you know, on Christmas Eve at the end of the yeah. selling day, that was the thing, you know, my birthday, different things like that. Or I, or I just feel like I just got to have one of these cigars. Um, it, it is my favorite cigar that's out there, but it, it's very expensive. Uh, never mind in California. Uh, it's expensive in New Hampshire. Uh, it's expensive, <laughs> but it is uh, it's very different. Yeah. You smoke that cigar and you smoke anything else. Our job when somebody comes in the store, especially when you don't have the cigar they're asking for, is I want brand X and you don't have it. And now you have to pick a cigar that's most like those cigars. And I'm pretty good at it. I can, you name something and I can pick something that's going to be like it that would suit your palate and be in that range because I know who makes the cigar and what tobaccos are used. Those three cigars I mentioned, I cannot take you anywhere else. That if you said I want an Aladino and I don't have it, there's nowhere for me to take you there because nothing tastes like that Corojo, nothing tastes like that Kentucky Fire Curedness of, of an Aladino, and nothing tastes like Atabay. So they are all unique in their way, and there's nowhere else to go but with those. Yeah. Well, and, and a friend of mine actually bought me an Atabay uh, for my birthday two years ago, uh, and I let it sit in my humidor for about a year, and I actually smoked it uh, this last summer. Um, and it, yeah, it was phenomenal. It, it, again, my palate normally is for the heavier full body, but that's another one of those cigars where it's it's a bit more mild to medium, but great flavor. Um, well, thank yeah, you so they, much. They to, make a uh, brand. Oh, all right. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. They, they, they make a brand called Byron, which is more of the fuller bodied um, line. It's, it's a different line. It's Mr. Jonathan's favorite, which would which would be Byron. But some of them, especially the darker ones, a little too heavy for me. But uh, that's his favorite of all. But um, Atabe for me is sensational. Gotcha. Well, th I, I mean, I want to thank you again for, for joining us on the show. It's, it's an honor to have Dave from, from Two Guys Cigars and Cigar Authority um, and just the education and, uh, again, the pioneering in the industry kind of brought to this. Um, so thank you so much for spending time with us. Eric, I'll be watching you. I think you're going to be uh, a big shot. You, you're going to be uh, the home run hitter here. I'm, I'm watching you. Oh, well, thank you so much. And and for anyone else who is watching, we do have the Cigar of the Year Oakland Tobacconist pack on our website. Go and order it. It'll be delivered to your door, uh, including the Perdomo Maduro, which we're smoking right now, which was Dave and Cigar Authority's Cigar of the Year for 2020. Um so thanks again, and I'll be watching um, the Cigar Authority uh, tomorrow, and I'm also very excited to hear what the new Firecracker is going to be because that's that sounds awesome. Yes. <laughs> so awesome. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you. Uh... All right. See you bye later. Bye.